Good morning. So I want to welcome you here. Uh, it's good to see you. And uh, we're going to open with prayer, and then we're going to sing our first hymn, uh, hymn number 202, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. So let's, uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for those who have gathered here this morning. Lord, we just ask that you uh, speak to our hearts today. Lord, just uh, open our hearts to be receptive to your word. Lord, let your spirit uh, speak clearly uh, within us. Lord, that we can go out and, and be doers of the word, not just hearers here today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, hail the power of Jesus' name. Let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. He chose and seed of Israel's race. He ransomed from the Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers, and Lord, that you care about us and you love us, and Lord, that you, um, that you are concerned and want to work in each one of our situations. And Lord, we have a, a long list here of people that, Lord, that have issues, that have needs, and Lord, we just lift them up to you this morning. We specifically, Lord, we lift up the Nolasco family. We lift up Eric and Diane as they continue to go through their health issues. Lord, we just ask that you be with them and, Lord, heal their bodies. Lord, as, as others are dealing, help the caregivers who, who are trying to take care of those that are sick. Lord, we pray for, for peace for, for Janine Burrow as she has turned over to hospice, Lord, with her cancer. Lord, we just ask that you... Uh, that you work in these situations, Lord, that we recognize that it's you working, Lord, and that we give you the credit for it. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. It's 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in the word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. Give thanks to God the Father through him. So we pour out our praise, we pour out our 
So I want you to turn in your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We are in our ongoing uh, summer series through the book of Ecclesiastes. And I thought, thought since last week we got through half of the book. And for some of you, you have not uh, been here the whole time or, you know, we've had summer. People's been traveling. You know, there's, uh, you know, in Sheral there, there's people that's been in and out. So what I thought is... Um, I thought we would just kind of take just a second and recap some of the things that Solomon has told us in the first six chapters. You know, you look and Solomon started off the, the book with his, his search for meaning, the meaning of life. What does really, what does life mean under the sun? You know, how we experience life from an earthly perspective. And he, he began to share with us some of his observations that he had observed all of these things that men do, and ultimately, what did he conclude? Is that there's nothing new, really. You know, it's just the same things recycled one time after another after another. It's, we may have new names for it. We may uh, have new packaging on it. But ultimately, that man just recycles the same things, the same ideas over and over and over. There's nothing new. And then he also said that life under the sun, from an earthly perspective, is really just vanity. It is empty. It is vain. But then he tells us, he's like, yes, ultimately life under the sun from an earthly perspective is empty. But there is some good that we can do if we recognize that our blessings come from God. That we can do good in this world because we have been blessed by God. He goes on in chapter 4 to talk about the value that we need to put on relationships. The value that we need to put on our friendships and our family and those kind of things. He said we need to make sure that we have the right people on our bus. I heard it said this week, who is on your bus? You want to make sure that you have the right people on your bus because if you don't, they're going to take the bus in a direction you don't want it to go. How do you know that you got the right people on your bus? It's because when the bus is in the ditch, those people stay on the bus. They don't uh, abandon it. Because when, you're, when times are down and there's hardship in your life, those who just want a relationship with you for what you can do for them, they will abandon you because you don't offer them anything anymore. But true friends, true relationships, guess what? They're going to stick around when the times get hard because they love you for you, not what you can do for them. So that is some of the things that Solomon has been talking about. He told us in chapter 5 that there is a specific way that we need to approach worship. It is not just that we sing these songs here and that that's part of worship. We sing praise and adoration to, to our Heavenly Father. But we also have to approach worship in a specific way to where our hearts and our minds are right. That we are prepared to have an encounter with God. And we don't just do that here on Sunday morning. Right? We may come to the church to worship, but our preparation starts Days in advance, right? We, we prepare ourselves through the week, through our Bible study and through our private prayer time and all those things. We prepare ourselves to worship. We don't just show up and think worship automatically happens because it doesn't if our hearts and our minds are not prepared. That's basically the first six chapters in the Cliff Notes version. You know, if we're going to take the Cliff Notes version here, that's, that's the, the first six chapters. Now... He's going to switch gears a little bit through the rest of the book. Solomon is going to switch gears and he's going to give us some more wisdom. But he's going to do it through kind of a narration. And then he's going to use a lot of Proverbs. 
So Solomon's going to teach us through Proverbs and through his, his narration. And there's a lot of detail in these last six chapters. Probably more detail than we're going to get into in the next, I don't know, six, eight weeks. We could probably start over in this series. I'm not going to, just, just so you know. But we could probably start over. And we could go back through the first six chapters and I could preach through them again and we would never hit on the same subject, right? There's so much depth in Ecclesiastes that we could completely take the first six chapters and preach it again and never talk about the same things that we talked about before. That is how much detail is in it. So we're not going to be able to cover every single thing that is in chapters 7 through 12, just like we couldn't cover everything that was in 1 through 6. But... We need to make sure that we hear what Solomon is saying because it is important. You're going to hear the word better this morning. That's what you're going to hear. You're going to hear that word better repeated over and over and over. And because Solomon is telling us that there are some things that are better for us in this life than others. That there are some things that, that are better for us. And there's some things that are worse for us. And he's going to observe that and tell us that. And so what I want to do before we break this down, I just want to read to you from the first 14 verses of Ecclesiastes chapter 7. He said, A good name is better than a precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of birth. It is better to go to the house of mourning to, than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind, and the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow is better than laughter, for by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better for a man to hear the rebuke of the wise than to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fools. This is also vanity. Surely oppression drives the wise into madness, and a bribe corrupts the heart. Better is the end of a thing than its beginning. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not quick in your spirit to become angry for, angry, for anger lodges in the heart of fools. Say not, where were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. Wisdom is good with an inheritance and advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. Consider the work of God, who can make straight what he has made crooked. In the day of prosperity, be joyful. In the day of adversity, consider that God has made one as well as the other, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. So I want to start out, we're just going to break this down really quickly this morning. There's a lot of stuff in these 14 verses. The first thing that I want to start off with is what Solomon says in verses 1 and 2. He says a reputation. He said a good name is better than a good ointment, and the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. If you go in and you, you look and you, you, you read and you try to study this, this first verse here, you get a lot of difference of opinions. Some people say that the second line of verse 1 has really nothing to do with, with the first line, that they are separate. Other people think that they, they form a, a couplet or a, a complete thought here. I think that probably there's a little bit of truth to both of these. And so we're going to look at it um, from, from that kind of perspective, kind of as a couplet. And he says, a good name is better than a good ointment. Basically what Solomon says is good reputation is better than smelling good. Because that's what they used the ointments for, right? So they didn't stink. He said, a good reputation is better than putting on good perfume. Why is that? Because you might smell good on the outside, but you can be rotten to the core on the inside. You can have the look. You can make people think that you are more than what you are or that you are something you're not. He says, but a good reputation, those people who have built a reputation over their life, it is better than looking the part. That is what Solomon is, is trying to tell us here this morning. He says that your character your integrity, all of those things matter to a person. It's better to have that good reputation. And here's, here's the thing. He 
He says the day of one's death is better than the day of one's birth. Why is that? Because at your birth, do you already have a reputation? No, you have no reputation. You have nothing at the day of your birth. And so how, do you, how long does it take to build your reputation? It takes all the way till the day of your death. Your reputation is built throughout your entire life. But once you are dead, once you have died, your reputation then is set in stone. There is no chance to change it any longer. And so if you spend your life building a good reputation, then when you die, people will remember who you were. But if you spend a life and you build a bad reputation, guess what's going to happen when you die? People will remember who you were. Had a uh, pastor one time, I went to a funeral. And the man, at, and I, I learned this lesson pretty, it was seared into my brain. There was a man that was being buried there at the church and the pastor was called to do the funeral. But this man had not lived a very good life. He did not have a very good reputation. And so the pastor got up and he began to try to talk about this individual. And he finally got to the point to where he kind of said, you know, I really don't have nothing good to say about him. He said, there's really not anything that I can tell you that is good because he had done this and he had done this. And he started, I mean, he started airing out all the dirty laundry right there in the middle of the man's funeral. None of it was a lie. It was all the truth. But you don't typically hear that at a funeral. And so obviously uh, the, the family of the man that was buried was not very happy with, with the pastor that had done that at the funeral. And so in my my mind there, I made a mental note that if I ever have to do a funeral with somebody that I'm not sure about their reputation, then we're just going to stick to the very basics and we're not going to touch on those because, you know, some things we don't need to say <laughs> in a public setting. You know what I'm saying? And so we're, we'll, but a good reputation, you don't have to worry about that, right? If you have a good reputation, you don't have to worry about what the preacher is going to say at your funeral because he's going to have good things to say about you. He's not going to stand up and say, well, I just don't know what I can say about this fellow. Uh, he wasn't very much of a, a good person. So, so we have to, um, have to make sure that we protect our reputations at all costs. Because, you know, it doesn't take very long. And you have all seen evidence of this. You've seen it. The old saying, it only takes one all shucks to mess up a thousand attaboys. Yeah, so one thing in your life, you could have built your reputation up for, for your entire life. And one mistake can ruin it all. That's all it takes. is for somebody to change their opinion about you and your reputation based on one incident in your life. And so we have to value our reputation. How do we do that? We do what we say we're going to do. We be honest. We be people of character. We be people of integrity. We be people of faith. We do not be hypocritical. And we do one thing and then call somebody else out for doing the same things. That is all things that build reputations. If we say that we're going to pay our bill on time, then we pay our bill on time. If we're going to take out a loan, we pay it back. All those things matter to build our reputation. Then he says the remembrance. This is where we got the title of this sermon this, this morning, Musings from a Mortuary. He says, it's better to go to a house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. Some of your translations may say to the house of amusement. Why is it better to go to a funeral rather than a party? Well, see, that word amusement, it actually means this. So you take the word muse. The word muse means to think, right? But when you put the A on the front of it, so amusement, the A neg negates and it actually changes it to not think. That's the word amusement. It means not to think. So why is it better to go to a house of mourning than it is to a house of amusement? Because when we go to a funeral, we tend to think. When we go to a party, we try to escape reality. That is what Solomon has said. It's better for us to go somewhere where we can think about things 
than it is to go somewhere to where we're trying to escape what is going on. Because when you're at a funeral, and we're either all going to go to a funeral at some point in our life, or we're going to be a part of a funeral at the end of our life. But we're all going to face it at one time or another. But when you go to a funeral, you know what starts to happen? doesn't matter who, who it is, really. But you begin to think about life, and you begin to think about your life, and you begin to think about the brevity of life. I had to do a funeral of a, of a young man. He was 19 years old. I had to do this about six months ago. His life was cut so short, and you know, the whole time that I was preaching his funeral, I kept thinking about just how short life really is, how we don't know when our day is coming, how much time we have left. All of those things you start to think about when you're faced with the reality of death, and there's no other place that you're going to be faced with that reality more vividly than at somebody's funeral. And so we need to think about those kind of things. The wise man, he comes to grips with the brevity of life. He doesn't think that life is going to last forever. He knows that there is an end point to his earthly existence if the Lord does not come back and take us home first. Now I'm praying, come Jesus, come Lord Jesus, and come quickly, right? Come on and take me home. I'm ready to go. But we also know that if he tarries, that he waits a little while longer, I may not make it long enough for him to see him come back, right? I'm going to meet him in the air, but it'll be from the ground and not from being alive. And so there's an end point to our life. And so when we think about these things, we can put our priorities in order. That's the application here, is you take what you think about at the funeral and you get your priorities in order. You make sure that the things that you need to take care of are taken care of. You value your relationships. You value the time you have with your children and your loved ones and your family and all of those things because you think about it. Where if you go to a party, you don't think about anything but having fun. You escape the reality of life and Solomon says that's foolish. Then he also says here, it's better. This is the rebuke. He says, it's better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than for one to listen to the song of fools. How many of you think it is very much fun to have somebody rebuke you? I ain't seeing many hands go up. Solomon said it's actually good. It is good for us to have somebody rebuke us who is wise. I'm going to qualify that, right? Solomon qualified it. He said, someone who is wise to come along beside you and tell you that you have done something that is not exactly right. Why? Because then it allows you the chance to make it right. It's wise. But a word of caution and I think this is, uh, this is something that holds true. He said, better than, the, than to listen to the song of fools. That is the false praise that, that the fools give somebody and it, it, it puffs up someone and makes them think a lot higher of themselves than they are. See, here's, here's the thing. Solomon says it's better to rebuke from a wise man. You say, well, who's a wise man? We all know people that we would go to for advice, right? If you've got a problem, there are certain people that you would go to for advice because you think they are wise and have the answers that would help you, right? So, here's the, here's the thing. Those people can criticize you because you trust them to tell you the truth and the right truth. But you never take criticism from somebody that you wouldn't take advice from. Why? Because if you do not think that they are wise enough to take advice from, then why would you accept a rebuke from them when you don't think they're wise enough to seek advice? But those who come to you that you know are wise, that you know have your best interest at heart, when they come and tell you something, then you ought to listen because you want them to be able to speak the truth to you. And sometimes as hard as it is, we need it. We need somebody to come say, hey, man, this ain't right. And there's a lot of you here that 
that have talked to me over the past eight years and you said, hey, Brandon, I think this might be better. And I take those words to heart because I trust that you have the best interest of this church. You have the best interest of the gospel. You have the best interest of me at heart. And so I thank you for those times, not that anybody's, you know, come up and said, hey, I think you're just a so-and-so and you need to, you know, it's not like that. But, hey, you know, we don't think this was the right way to, to handle this situation, and I appreciate that thing because it makes people better. And then here's a big one. We're going to talk about reminiscing. How, you, how many of you like to think about the good old days? Right? You like to think about the good old days. Man, it was so much better back then. Here's what Solomon says. He says, the end of the matter... Is better than the beginning. Patience of spirit is better than the haughtiness of spirit. Do not be eager in your heart to be angry, for anger resides in the bosom of fools. But do not say, why is the former days better than these? All right, so this is, there's a lot of information in this one little section in verse 8 and 10. So let's break this down just a little bit further. He says, the end of a matter is better than the beginning. We live in a day of instant gratification. If you want something, you don't have to get in your car and you don't have to drive all over the countryside looking for it. You can find it how fast. If I need to buy something, I can usually pull out my phone, I can pick up Amazon, I can type it in, and it's on its way in less than 24 hours, right? I can get it right now. If I want to talk to somebody, I don't have to, to get in the car and drive over to their house. I can pick up the phone. I can call them. Or better yet, most of the time, I can just send them a text message really quickly and I'm in contact with them. How many of you have ever started a project and you think about the project and how hard it's going to be and how long it's going to take and all of the things that go into the project and you sit there and you go, man, I don't want to do this. I just don't want to do this. But then you get into the project and you start to work on it and, and you, you get deeper and deeper and you see a little bit of, um, you see a little bit of success. You see a little bit of things happening and then before very long you get done and you look back. And you say, wow, look what I did. The end of a matter is better than the beginning because you get to see all of the things that you have been able to accomplish in that short amount of time. You know what? It teaches patience. It teaches patience. When we were, we were building country clubs, Every one that, that I worked on was a little bit different, and each project was a little different. But you started off, and you thought, oh, there's no way I'm going to be able to take this 250 acres and, and turn it into to something that is, is actually playable and usable, and people are going to come here and, and spend their money playing this golf course. You think there's no way. And then you start to, little by little, you start chipping away and moving the dirt, and things start to take shape. But then... Never fails. You get a big rainstorm and you had everything ready. You almost had grass. You're getting ready to put the grass down. You get three or four inches of rain and now you've got, you know, gullies that are washed out in the fairways up to your, up to your belly button. And so you start all over again and you refix it and you put it back in. But you know what? Those kind of things, those projects and things like that, we do, it teaches us patience. It teaches us fortitude. It teaches us how to keep on keeping on even when the times get tough and things come up that we have to continue to move forward and overcome obstacles. We have to adapt and overcome. Isn't that the uh, Marine Corps mentality? You adapt and you overcome. That's what Solomon says. He's like, it's better at the end than it is at the beginning. He said, patience is good. It's better than having a prideful spirit. How many of you would describe yourself as patient? I know I wouldn't describe myself as patient. Landon, would you describe me as patient? Ride with me in the car for a little bit through Pueblo. You find out I'm not very patient. Get out of the way. 
But he says there is a, there's a correlation between impatience and pride. That those who are impatient usually are prideful. Why? Because they think, well, my time's more important than your time, so you get out of my way and let me do what I want to do. That's usually what happens here. He said patience is something that we should, should strive for. And then he comes to this matter. He says, do not say that the former days are better than the others. For it is not from wisdom that you ask about it. How many times I've sit with my grandfather, sit with my dad, and they talk about the good old days. Usually on a lawn chair in the backyard while we're making homemade ice cream or you know having a barbecue. And oh man, things in my day were so much better. But you know what happens usually when we start reminiscing about the good old days? We usually leave out a lot of details or we view it with rose-colored glasses, right? We want to see everything that was great about the good old days. Matter of fact, uh, Landon and I were driving back last night. We are driving back home and, and I made mention that, you know, at some point maybe we're going to drive back to North Carolina um, we'll, we'll make that trip again instead of flying. And he's like, why would we do that? I said, well, that last trip was fun. He's like, it wasn't the same trip that I went on. <laughs> you know, but you, you start to, to think about it and you think about the good things and not all of the bad things that happen. As a matter of fact, you hear today people, and Alan, you can correct me, but um, Alan's the, you know, the mechanic here. But, hey, the, the older cars, you hear people say, oh, all these older cars are better than the newer cars. You know, if I could just have my old car back, they may be easier to work on. I will, I will agree. They don't have as much stuff on them. You don't need a degree in electrical engineering and physics and everything else to work on them. But I saw a video the other day, and people say, oh, if I could just have my old car back, it's so much better than the newer one. But they did a crash test. And they took an older model car from the 60s and they took one from today. And they ran it at 60 mile an hour into a concrete wall. You know what happened to the older car? It was completely destroyed. It looked like an accordion when they got done. They ran that same newer car into the concrete wall at 60 mile an hour. And with the new technology and the crumple zones and everything else, who was inside was not hurt at all. And so we look at it and say, oh, yeah, these things were better, but yet we don't really see the truth sometimes when we reminisce about the old days that, hey, it's not as good as maybe we thought it was. There was a, there was a guy here. I'm going to read you a quote from him. He said, I see no hope for the future of our people if they are dependent on the frivolous youth of today, for certainly all youth are reckless beyond words. When I was young, we were taught to be discreet and respectful of our elders, but the present youth are impatient of restraint. Now, does that sound like a quote that could be uttered today by our parents' or grandparents' generation? Right? That's, that's something that we would hear or maybe we would say ourselves. That was actually attributed to a man named Herioid, in the 8th century B.C. He was a Greek poet back in the 800s who was saying the exact same thing that we say today. Man, these kids are going to ruin everything. It's basically what he's trying to say, right? Because, oh, it was so much better when we were kids. Well, guess what? He didn't remember his parents were saying the same thing about him and they, their parents were saying the same thing about his. It's gone on forever. And so we have to be very careful that we do not get so wrapped up in what has happened that we can't enjoy what is happening now. Psalm 118 verse 24 says what? This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let's make today better so we don't have to reminisce about the good old days. And then finally, we're going to look at our, our last two points here. He said, Wisdom along with an inheritance is good and advantage to those who see the sun. For wisdom is a protection 
just as money protects, but the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of its possessors. Solomon said, wisdom is good and wealth is good. He said, if you have wisdom and wealth, you got the best of both worlds. He's like, but sometime wisdom without wealth, that's a recipe for disaster. Or excuse me, wealth without wisdom is a recipe for disaster. I got that backwards there. Why is that? Well, wealth offers a certain protection against poverty. Wisdom offers protection against foolishness. Oftentimes we see the very wealthy don't live longer. Why? Because they don't have the wisdom that keeps them from doing foolish things that their money buys them and then they end up shortening their life. He said, wisdom has an advantage over money in the fact that it keeps its people from doing foolish things which preserve their life longer. We need to seek wisdom in our life. And then finally, the receiving. He said, consider the work of God, for who is able to straighten what he has bent? In the day of prosperity, be happy, but in the day of adversity, consider that God has made the one as well as the other, so that man will not discover anything that will be after him. Solomon starts off this last section of chapter 7 with a rhetorical question. He said, who can bend what God has straightened? He doesn't give us the answer because the answer is obvious to him. What is the answer to who can bend what God has straightened or who can straighten what God has bent? What's the answer to that? Anybody? Nobody. (laughs) No one can straighten what God has bent. Solomon knew that very quickly. No one can undo what God has done except God himself. There's no one power more powerful than God in this universe. He created it. He has the power over it and the sovereignty over it. And so what Solomon is basically telling us is kind of getting to the point here. Solomon says that in your life, Sometimes you're going to have good things and bad things. They're going to happen. And sometimes you are just going to be forced to play the hand that you were dealt. Just like when you go to Las Vegas and you're playing blackjack and the dealer turns over two cards and you look at them and say, man, I didn't want these cards. These are terrible. Guess what? You don't have no choice. You've got to play the cards that they dealt you. Guess who is the ultimate dealer in this life? God is the dealer. He deals the cards, and we have to play the cards that he has dealt us. This is important because he is in control. God is in control. That is, that is the facts. That's just, that's just the brass tacks there. God is in control. And there is nothing that happens in this world that is outside of his sovereignty. Nothing. Nothing. Nothing will ever happen that he does not know about. There's nothing that crops up in your life that surprises God. He knows every bit of it. You might, well, you might say, well, then, Pastor, what's the point then? What's the point? This is fatalism. You know, I can't do nothing about it. It's just going to happen. You know, K sera, sera, all of that good stuff. It's not. You see, God has dealt man this life. And in this life, he has also given man freedom. God gives man freedom to make choices. We all make choices every day. We make a lot of them. And if you think about it, all of the choices that you have made in your life, just just for today, all of the choices that you have made in your life, you know they have led you to be here at First Southern Baptist Church at 1130 on Sunday morning on August the 20th. Any one of the choices, if you had made differently, may have led you to be somewhere else today and not here. But all the choices, the sum total of your choices, have led you to this point here today. And God knew every one that you were going to make ahead of time. But with the choices that we make also come some consequences, sometimes very painful. God knows those too. He knows the choices that we make. He also knows the trouble that we bring on ourselves sometimes. And so we make choices. As the, I've said this before and I'll say it again. 
If we play stupid games, what do we win? Stupid prizes. That is, just, that is just the way that life goes, right? There are natural consequences for our actions. And, and sometimes God uses those, right, to teach us a lesson. Sometimes God brings things in our life that are not very, um, they're very painful, that hurt. Why does he do that? Because he's trying to get us back. And draw us back to him because he sees where we're headed. And so he uses the choices that we make to discipline us and those consequences to bring us back to him. But you can't say, oh, why is God doing this to me when we've done it to ourselves a lot of times? By the choices we make. It's not fatalism. Real decisions have an impact on the way that we live. There's going to be good things. There's going to be bad things that happen in our life. But here is the real application here. Whether it's good things, whether it's bad things, we need to make sure that we thank God for all things. Because everything that happens in our life has been filtered through the nail-scarred hands of Jesus Christ. They have, it has passed through his hands. He knows exactly what's going to happen. And he's granted it in our life. He has said, I'm going to allow this to happen, right? Even you go back to Job. All the bad things that happened to Job, did God, he didn't cause it, but what did he do? He allowed it to happen, right? He allowed it to happen. He allowed Satan to go so far. God knew it was going to happen. You know, there's the, the old saying, the prayer that we've probably all seen written down and we maybe have prayed ourselves. It says, Lord, give me the courage to change what I can change and to accept those things that I cannot change and then the wisdom to know the difference. You know, there's some things in our life we're just not going to be able to change. We're going to have to deal with it. We're going to have to trust God and have faith through it. There's some things in our life that we can change and we maybe need to change. And we can do that. We just have to know to spend the time on the things we can change and not on the things we can't. Because sometimes we spend too much time on the things that we can't change only to find out that we could have changed some other things and made it a lot better for ourselves in the long run. So basically, the bad news is there's some things we can't change. Just the way it is. That's the bad news. But the good news is that even though I can't change them, they were brought into my life by God the Father, and I can take comfort in knowing that it is for my benefit that I have to go through these things. I maybe not can see it right now, but I know that God has a purpose and a plan for everything that happens in my life. And so we can be like Paul and say, I give thanks in all situations. Paul knew good. Paul knew a lot of bad in his life. But he said, I can thank God in every situation. We need to be able to do that too because all situations are filtered through the hands of God in our life. That's the good news. So we're going to sing our hymn of invitation, hymn number 176, Fairest Lord Jesus. We're going to sing verse 1 and verse 4, and maybe there's something on your heart, I don't know, that you need to, to, to pray about this morning. The altar's open. Maybe there's, um, if I can pray with you here at the front, do not hesitate. Um, but let's make sure that we, this morning, take the words of Solomon. Figure out what is better for us and then go out and do that this week. Uh, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you. Lord, we thank you for, for your word. Lord, we thank you that you do bring things in our life. Lord, whether it's good or bad, Lord, we know that they're from your hand, that you are sovereign, that you are in control. Nothing surprises you, Lord. And so we can give thanks in all situations, Lord, that we can be uh, content knowing that, that you are in control. Lord, that there's choices that we make every day that have an effect on our life, Lord, but you know those choices that we're going to make. Lord, that you have, have made the ultimate choice, 
Lord, to send your son, to Jesus, to die for us. Lord, help someone here this morning to choose him, the best choice that they could ever make by giving them their, their life in salvation. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There is Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, both of God and man the Son. Me will I change. i